Hello and welcome to The Drum. I'm Dan Borshit coming to you from the lands of the Gadigal people. Coming up, Qantas Parachute. Alan Joyce bails early as anger grows from customers and shareholders. Coal Country, Australia's biggest power station to stay open amid energy supply concerns. And Renta writes New South Wales' first rental commissioner on how she's standing up to landlords. Joining me on the panel, education lecturer at Western Sydney University and former Greens candidate, Rachel Jacobs. Great to have you along. Nice to be back. In Brisbane, International Director at the Smart Energy Council, Richie Mersey. And hey there. Hello. In Canberra, political reporter at The Guardian Australia with one of the best jumpers I think I've ever seen, Amy Ramikis. Great to have you along. Hello. And in Melbourne, business owner and Red Balloon founder, Naomi Simpson. Good evening. Hello. And you can join us online using the hashtag The Drum and we live stream on Facebook as well. First tonight, Australia's largest coal-fired power station will get a new lease on life amid new warnings of electricity supply challenges in transitioning away from fossil fuels. The Araring power station between Sydney and Newcastle is due to close in 2025, but the New South Wales government says it will now negotiate with the operator, Origin Energy, to keep it open for longer. It's one of the recommendations of a new report into the state power needs released by Energy Minister Penny Sharp today. There are reliability risks um, with uh, Araring exiting early. That's why we're going to talk to Araring and talk about what the options are. But I don't want taxpayers to pay one cent more than they need to and I don't want Araring open one minute more than it needs to. The way that I see this is the government's role is to make sure that we do this transition as quickly as possible that we try to smooth the bumps, and there will be bumps on the way through, at the least cost to consumers, and so that we end up with the most reliable electricity network. Penny Sharp wouldn't say how long the station could or would remain open, or how much taxpayers might subsidise Origin to keep it running. But Origin says it's spending $250 million a year on equipment and repair alone. Amy, I want to start with you. What's at play here? Well, it's the political situation when it comes to our energy needs is pretty fraught at the moment. We keep getting reports saying that there are capability warnings that we may not actually make it through the summer because increasing heat waves, because of increasing uh, pressures from climate change mean that we're all turning on our air conditioners. And what do you know? The thing that with increasing climate change, coal-fired power among them, is the thing that we turn to to try and keep the power on. But in that political climate, governments don't feel that they can say, actually, no, we're going to stick to the plan to cut the emissions and to stop these power plants from continuing their lifespan. And we're going to move to renewable energy because we've had about 10 years of no climate policy. So we've got a pretty big gap there when it comes to putting enough renewables into the grid. So it's just it's a pretty big political mess. There is the right thing to do. There's the political thing to do. And what we're seeing is uh, governments trying to walk both sides of those lines at the moment. Mm. Uh, Richie, this report recommended the government discuss delaying the closure of Araring, which is set for, as I, I mentioned, August 2025, and that its closure would require the state to speed up the building of new energy projects and that the, quote, likelihood of success is low. So is this report really saying that the new projects just aren't going to be ready in time and that there is going to be an energy gap here? Well, look, the commissioned report was really answering the question of should we keep this coal clunker open a bit longer and has come back and said, yeah, maybe we should, but it's asked the wrong question. The question that we should have asked is, how do we make sure we can close down coal-fired power stations when they're supposed to retire? And there is a raft of renewable energy developers and investors ready to go with the rollout for clean energy that is also cheaper energy. And so really the New South Wales government has an opportunity to set the right direction. They might have inherited this problem, but the direction they set will have a huge impact on investment in the energy grid in New South Wales over the next couple of years. If they go down the path of publicly subsidising more coal, it will chill more investment and kick the can down the road. Instead, all these renewable energy projects are available and ready for the New South Wales government to roll out. And what it needs to do is unlock some of the roadblocks in the planning area and it will meet all the reliability, all the price cost concerns and most importantly, its emission reduction targets if it chooses to go down this path. Naomi, do you agree with that? No. So, look, any great leadership plan has to have optionality. Last week we saw that the hydroelectric 
um, scheme is is running late. Um, we've looked at solar power. We have a grid that is ancient, so it can't take enough power into it. Um, when we look at wind power, you've got to look at the loss of energy as it tries to get to the source of where it needs to go. So I think what we do need is an overarching infrastructure program, and I don't think that work has necessarily been done. But I think it would be short-sighted to say absolutely under no circumstances and we have to stick to this. To create really great leadership, you actually have to have optionality because the worst thing would be if we can find that we actually can't even run our infrastructure, let alone our, our um, essential services, because we haven't got the power. Nobody wants coal power in Australia to continue, but what we also don't want to do is to come to an end of a highway um, without having somewhere to go. And, and I do disagree. Our renewable energy program is not yet ready. Hmm. Uh, Richie, this afternoon on Afternoon Briefing, Matt Keane from the opposition said, quote, the only thing they've done on energy is appoint a Labor mate to undertake a review which is telling them to give a big taxpayer subsidy to big coal when the market operator, the independent market operator, says it's not needed. You said the right question wasn't asked. How do you react to those comments? Well, it, it, it's interesting to hear the former energy minister of New South Wales actually lay out a pathway that aligns with our climate ambitions as well as our energy objectives. Right now, the energy market operator has identified a relatively modest reliability gap in two years' time. That can be met with renewables. I'm in Brisbane right now at the Smart Energy Queensland conference where Brisbane and Queensland State Government are getting on with their renewable pathway. And so really the question should be asked, which pathway does New South Wales Government want to roll down right now? And the renewable energy is there waiting to roll through. The issues have been in the planning department and fortunately the government can bring this together. Matt, Matt Keane set out a pathway that was bipartisan and so really the New South Wales government has an opportunity to ask the right questions and set the right directions and the investment and the renewables will follow. Mm. Uh, Rachel, the report made 54 recommendations. The government's accepted uh, 50 either fully or in part. What do you think this report was trying to do? Well, it is good that these reports are happening because um, Labor hadn't been in government for a long time, so there mm. is a lot of catch-up to do. But this is the price of, of climate inaction. This is the result of stalling on renewables, of um, pushing it backwards and things like that. And, you know, I respectfully disagree with what Naomi said, that nobody wants to see coal fire power continue. Um, that's not actually true. So federal, federally, Labor has invested in more coal, you know, more coal mining in Queensland to continue until like 2073. So there is actually huge investment in the coal sector. But what we're seeing is that that gap, in, you know, due to climate inaction, now we're just trying to play catch up until it's, you know, we're so close to it being too late. The government would also say, federal government, that they're spending a huge amount of money in renewables at the same time though, wouldn't they? Well, there's, a, you know, there's no such thing as climate action if you're still subsidising coal. That's just, you know, not, not to the extent that we need to be investing in renewables and definitely not as fast. I don't know what about urgent climate action. The urgent part just isn't getting through. We've got bushfires on our doorstep. We've seen floods. We've seen, there is no great a warning there is no greater time than now there is actually no time for us to be kicking the can down the road so, so when in, in this report it indicates that the likelihood of, of success is low in terms of those new projects then what's the answer here one of the things that the report said is that um, is that we need to keep it open if we don't transition to renewables and then it did outline a number of reasons why that is really hard and the reasons why that is really hard is the stalling and then the inaction um, on on climate change and things like that but I just want to also mention um, that that Labor's really trying to trying to wash their hands of this and saying things like it would be much easier if um, we owned the energy sector and things like that these are the people who tried to who started by selling off um, you know the power lines and the, the the poles to begin with so once you start down that path it's really hard to reverse this is how privatization kind of damages us mm. um, I want to bring you back in uh, Richie what do you think that New South Wales needs to be doing to address these issues that this reports highlighted the New South Wales government did announce that it will put more action towards renewables in, in community projects. If you're going to subsidise one thing, it should be the solution. So putting more support towards having rooftop solar, having household batteries, commercial scale renewables, uh, more electric vehicles and vehicle to grid. 
a lot of these solutions are quick and easy to roll out because you're doing it at that retail, at that household level. The more renewables we can get on rooftops, the more batteries we can get in homes and on buildings and working with some of the large energy users to allow them to access renewables will actually start filling this gap and give us the kind of confidence we need to hit those targets that this government have also set for themselves when it comes to the renewable electricity on the grid. Uh, Naomi, is, the, is that the, the part of the solution here? Is this multi-pronged? That on one hand it's about uh, solar on people's homes while also looking at the infrastructure, as you touched on, that it's actually about doing a whole lot of things at the same time? Look, trying to move our community um, all at once to new technologies just isn't practicable. If we think about battery technology and lithium that is required as a rare earth, then we can't produce enough batteries, let alone the footprint that they also create. So we've moved the problem there. The second thing is, in terms of the grid, and I'm no uh, you know, electronics expert, but I understand the way that our grid is designed is to deliver energy to a destination. It is not a two-way street. So we can't just simply keep plugging energy straight back into the grid. So, you know, when we look at electric vehicles, actually the worst thing we can do is write off all of our existing cars. That would be the worst thing for the planet. What we need to do is look at new technologies that actually retrofit those vehicles so that you're not wasting all of that, the, the precious metals and everything else that goes into a car, including the technology. So, you know, I, I don't, we are not ready and we don't have the infrastructure. So right now, optionality is important. But what we do need is a clear roadmap and, and we need to look and invest in new technologies such as hydrogen. If we're not ready now, I, I, I don't know when we're going to be ready and I don't know how much we have to lose before we have to have to get ready. And, you know, Richie's the expert and can probably give us the details on the batteries and, you know, and the storage and things like that. But overseas, other countries have invested in renewables in such a massive way, such as Germany transitioning entirely to renewables. Scotland, whereas here, where sun and wind are free and abundant for all, we're still so slow. Even India and China are investing in renewables in such a big way. So the answer that it's just not possible or it's not feasible is just an excuse at this stage. Richie, is it possible or feasible? It is possible, it is feasible and it's happening. And uh, I loathe to use this term, but it is a race right now. So the United States has basically brought forward a, a raft of subsidies to the tune of half a trillion dollars Australian. And what it's doing is building those solutions in the United States to fast track their transition. It's acting as a vacuum cleaner right now for investment in manufacturing the solutions and rolling them out locally. And we're seeing a similar type of package delivered in the, U the EU, in Japan, and certainly China, which has been leading the way in this. This mentality that somehow it's not possible or it's beyond our reach or we have to just sit and wait for things to catch up, I think has put us in this situation. And the idea that we are going to subsidize more coal to Origin Energy that made over a billion dollars last year, including a profit from Araring, seems ridiculous in 2023. It's entirely possible and it's something that we should be doing. And if we don't do it, if we subsidize more coal, we're sending absolutely the wrong direction. Amy, you uh, said at the start, this whole debate is fraught. Well, we're hearing this. This is the real, uh, the complexity of this is so deep. And all of this comes as the Australian energy market operator last week said uh, that there would likely be uh, an elevated risk of power outages in South Australia and Victoria. You touched on summer and, and the heat that we're going to be seeing. AEMO also modelled an extension of Araring operations and said it would reduce blackout risks later in the decade which also goes to this challenge that the states and territories and the Commonwealth have. But does this all really boil down to politics and what is palatable to be able to communicate with the community? 
It absolutely is all politics and this country is fairly held hostage by fossil fuel interests and we know that because we know that every single time a government steps out and says we're going to look at rewiring the nation, we're going to look at transitioning, we're going to look at renewables, we have huge campaigns that are supported by elements of our political system about how this is going to see Australia essentially sink into the dark ages or the ocean and it is getting absolutely ridiculous because we keep prosecuting the exact same arguments. AEMO has been warning of power blackouts for years. And yes, it did say that we need to perhaps look at extending the life of some of our coal assets, but only if we don't get the renewables on the grid. And we are trying to get the renewables on the grid, but there is a massive block there. And that block is people going, oh, we can't do it. We can do it, we just have to support the people who are trying to do it and break that mentality that it's coal or nothing. So what's the uh, solution here? Is, is it a political party to say, no, this is what we are going to do and we're going to forge ahead even if it's difficult or costs potentially elections? <laughs> I mean... I think you just answered your own question there. I mean, it's it's not really necessarily even up to the political parties. It's up to the voters and what they want. And they send a fairly strong message at the last election and they will continue to send that strong message, particularly as we see younger voters take more of the voting power in this country. And I think we're going to see a lot of our politicians quickly realise that their views are outdated and they're speaking to the wrong group of people. Because when you start hearing warnings that a child born today may only have a life expectancy of 40 or 50 years because of climate change, when we're finding bodies on the Swiss Alps that have been missing since the 70s and the 80s because climate change means that those Alps are starting to melt, when no emperor chick, penguin chick, has survived the last season because of climate change, these things, they stop being theoretical and they start coming into the here and the now. It is here, it is happening. We have a very small window to change the trajectory that we're on and politicians actually just need to grow a spine and start doing the right thing rather than the political thing. Rachel? Sing it, Amy. That, that, that nails it. We want to get to the stage where this is the reason you win an election is because you're taking climate action. And the last uh, federal election, pe young people particularly came out in droves. Uh, people at every um, end of the spectrum as well have said it's time to do something about these horrific bushfires and floods and, you know, what we're experiencing, the heat where I work in Western Sydney, the heat on the ground. It is here and now. It's not something that's going to happen in the future. It's not something academic like a you know a 1.5 or a two degree rise we can feel it here and now and this is going to change people's minds at elections but not in the way the old parties had thought well, and there's an interesting point there because this is a lot about the, the big picture but what happens though when there are blackouts and people don't have lights or, or air conditioning? I'll tell you what happens is that conservatives come out and say this is because of renewables and it's total lies. Um, it's a, that That's what where the spin is that people come out and say how dangerous it is to be trans transitioning to renewables when this is actually our only option. Hmm. Naomi, final question to you, is it the only option? Oh, there's always there's always another option, but I think what the question that we've just asked is democracy working for us because is a three year term for a federal government enough to make real uh, mm. change, um, and uh, maybe that that's we don't have a long enough term view on how we do these things. Um, any any project. Any transition, any change requires a deep sense of purpose, aligning everybody to the cause and making sure you have milestones for success. And those three things are things that I just don't see here. I think I just saw the first time that the whole panel nodded in unison when you were talking about democracy. <laughs> so I've just jotted that down. We're going to circle back and, and have a conversation about uh, that here on the drum at some stage. Uh, well, the Reserve Bank left interest rates on hold today at 4.1% as inflation continues to slow. But RBA Governor Philip Lowe, in his final rates decision before handing over to his deputy Michelle Bullock, has warned more rate hikes are still possible. Inflation is still too high and will remain so for some time yet. While goods price inflation is eased, the prices of many services are rising briskly. Rent inflation is also elevated. Some further tightening of monetary policy may be required to ensure that inflation returns to target in a reasonable time frame. But that will continue to depend upon the data and the evolving assessment of risks. 
The board remains resolute in its determination to return inflation to target and will do what is necessary to achieve that. Some economists believe there's still one more rate hike to come, with tomorrow's GDP figures giving a more accurate picture of the country's economic health. The rates announcement comes against the backdrop of a strengthening housing market and a major crunch on housing supply. Sydney remains the most expensive rental market in Australia, with a vacancy rate hovering around at 2%. In response to that, the state government has recently appointed the first ever rental commissioner. Trina Jones is a former CEO of Homelessness New South Wales and will now work with the government to advocate for renters' rights and joins us now. Welcome to the program. Thank you. You've been in this new role for about two months. It comes off the back of the work that you've been doing. What are you hearing right now? I'm week four. As oh, week South four, yes, in fact. I'm, I'm week four as the New South Wales Rental Commissioner and I'm wasting no time getting on to the priority urgent issues for renters. What we know is that people are under a lot of stress. Renters are feeling the cost of living crisis and they're really struggling right now and concerned about being able to keep their home and live in safe and secure homes. Um, I grew up in social housing myself and I have a deep belief that everyone should have a safe place to call home and that's why I'm here in the role as Rental Commissioner to be a voice for renters and with renters to strengthen rights in New South Wales. And how will you do that? We'll do it by working together. This is a complex issue. It's about housing policy, right? This is a complex issue and we're not alone in this challenge. We know that there are rental crises all over the world. This has been, you know, it's simple to blame COVID, but there have been decades of challenges in the housing market that has led to this rental crisis. And so we know that we can't solve those challenges overnight, but what we can do is create a fair, quality and affordable rental experience by working together to achieve that. And what sort of powers or levers do you have to pull that can help to make that happen? So I work in the Department of Fair Trading, I'm alongside the Fair Trading Commissioner, the Property Services Commissioner and the Building Commissioner. And our function, as much as it's about bringing people together, driving policy change and making recommendations to government, we're also regulators. And so we have powers under those regulations to ensure that we can enforce the rights of renters and ensure that we have a quality and safe rental market. So, and are there any kind of legal mechanisms that you can pull to compel or, or like are there actual powers there? So the Residential Tenancies Act covers a, re, a world remit of different types of powers. Some of them are enshrined by the NCAT Tribunal um, who will oversee matters relating to rental tenancies and other matters and others are um, at the discretion of the Secretary or the Department of Fair Trading. So depending on the issue, it would really depend. But we definitely do have power to make change and also what we do have is a mandate to ensure that that change centres the rights of renters. Mm. Uh, Rachel, I understand that you own a property in Queensland, you rent here in Sydney. What's been your the experience? The bank owns the property in Queensland. Yeah, just, just or as I, as I call it, yeah, a, yeah. a long-term relationship that I'm in with yeah. the bank. Yeah, um, yeah no, I, yeah, I am um, both a rent, renter and a landlord, so just to be totally transparent mm. about that. My rent has gone up like, like everyone's, but this isn't about me. This is about people who, when their rent goes up, it means they'll be ending up with family and friends or at a caravan park or couch surfing or, you know, in the Hunger Games that is looking for a new rental property at this stage. Um, so th this is d definitely about, um, you know, having the Rental Commissioner is long overdue to make sure that their people who are in the system are treated fairly doesn't change the system. This, there is a structural piece of inequality here that is not addressed by having a rental commissioner as much as it is definitely needed. So while it is, a, it is necessary, there is a bigger picture to look at and I, I hope we get an opportunity to talk through that thoroughly. Is that structural piece of inequality, is that just confined to housing policy or is this something well, it's, um, you know, there's a whole lot of arms to it, but really on housing policy, what we've done with things like capital gains tax, what we've done um, with tax breaks um, for investors means that investing and building your investment portfolio is what is attracting people to the property market rather than good old putting a roof over your head. There are some people, young people today, if you don't have inherited wealth, you may never own your own home. That may never be part of your aspiration. Mm.
Uh, Amy, you and I have reported on federal politics for a long time. I don't know if you've got a chill when uh, ever you talk about capital gains or negative gearing, which has come up election after election after election. Yeah, I mean, a chill, an eye twitch, uh, and a, just a desire to throw myself onto the floor and scream. I mean, it is, it is interesting because, again, this is just politics because there are massive changes that we could make to our housing market tomorrow. But it would take, you know, political will and a political spine. And I think a lot of political parties have maybe learnt the wrong lessons from the 2019 election when Bill Shorten took Labor to that election with a pretty big tax reform package. And the big scare campaigns have meant that people have gone, we can never touch that ever again. But we have to touch that because we are facing a generation of people being locked out out of the housing market, of people who will be renting their entire lives. And we don't have a rent system that is set up for that. We don't have renters' rights. I mean, it is great that New South Wales has a rent, uh, rent commissioner now, but as Rachel was saying, it doesn't change the system. So if your rent goes up uh, by, you know, $600 a month, you can go contact uh, the government and say, hey, do you think this is right? And the government will go, well, actually, Actually, yeah, because they look at it as to where the rental market is. And if the rental market is high, as it is now, and your rent increase falls just below that, then you don't have a leg to stand on in terms of how high your rent increase went. We don't actually have the systems in place to deal with this sort of stuff. And it's really interesting seeing the voting power begin to change because uh, the new Liberal Senator, Maria Kovovic, has just done her first speech in the Senate where she raises the prospect of maybe capping the number of negatively geared properties that one person can own. And just even a year or so ago, that you would never have heard a Liberal MP say that because it was seen as political poison. But the shift is happening whether po politicians want it or not, whether housing investors want it or not. And I think we're going to start to see rapid change, and the same in climate change. We're going to see younger generations come up and just say, you are not representing us, this is not working for us, and if you don't do something to change the system, we're going to change you. Yeah, Richie, it is pretty significant, isn't it, to hear what Amy was saying about the, the new senator floating that idea of those caps. And it also goes to this is a, a state territory issue, but it's also a Commonwealth one. There are layers and layers of challenge here, aren't there? That's right. I mean, we're dealing with a symptom here for a bigger problem in the housing market. We've had numerous governments say that supply is the issue. If that really is the case, then we should go ahead and address that primary concern. The Australian government knows how to build houses. It already has uh, a whole arm for building defence housing that it could bring to bear on this issue, let alone actually just invest in more housing. The other part to this is that renters also suffer because their homes are poorer quality. They're less likely to have solar panels to reduce their bills or to have insulation in their homes or to have double glazing. And so they're spending more just to have the same standard of living as those who do have a home. And that is unfortunately the majority of Australians are those who own homes. And so you also have an issue around who is representing and it's good to see the New South Wales government moving forward with at least this particular initiative. Naomi, I wonder if, and this might be controversial, investors are part of the solution here. In, in the ACT, there's a scheme, I think it's called Rentwell with the YWCA, that if you uh, rent to someone who is really needing a home and is, is finding all those systemic barriers and challenges, and you do it at a reduced rate, so it's not extraordinarily expensive, there'll be a reduction on your land tax. Is that a way, is that one of the levers that could be called, pulled? Uh, look, there, there's the whole concept of um, uh, build to rent and um, speaking of, you know, there, there's the fundamentals of the, of economics which is supply and demand um, and when there's over over demand you know too much demand and under supply then obviously there's price pressures whether that's when it comes to renting or whether that comes to buying um, I think one of the most exciting things about this appointment is the opportunity to look at things structurally completely differently uh, and to look at um, models from around the world. In Europe, for instance, you, you can have a lease on a home for 99 years or 
20 years and that gives a very different landscape for people who are renting. There's many people who actually don't want to own a home for many reasons, whether it's that they move a lot or that they're um, in certain circumstances. So I think the most important and the remit about making renters safe uh, is a really important one. Being able to hang a picture and have a pet in your home, um, one would say, is, is the fundamentals of living. So I'm excited to think of how we could look at these things um, structurally um, and for the longer term, because it, the, there is no quick fix here. Um, there is a fundamental of supply and demand on both sides, whether you're an investor or whether you're a, a renter. And if we don't have investors, then we won't have enough rental properties. And that's the way our system works at the moment. But we've had that argument that has gone on since post-war to actually before that, since the early 1900s, we have had this argument in multiple inquiries that if we have some sort of renters' rights, that we're going to see landlords start to exit the market and that's going to be a bad thing for renters. That has been going on for more than 100 years, 200 years, and it has not actually ever borne fruit. And in fact, after they did the curtain chiefly um, major national national build of homes, they saw it as a good thing if landlords sold their investment properties because it meant that a first homeowner could buy a property and we weren't using people as basically collateral to pay off you know, somebody else's investment, that we were allowing people to invest in their ho own lives. Housing is the most expensive it has been in about 30 years. And yes, supply and demand is part of an issue, but we can fix it tomorrow. We can release more supply. We can put renters' rights in because when we look at supply and demand, one of the reasons housing is so expensive is because we've locked up so much land and we haven't allowed more people to enter the market, therefore limiting the number of homes that we're able to get, which is something that property developers support because if you put more homes into the market, then suddenly those properties are not as expensive. It's also an issue because people who have seen their property increases go from, you know, they bought it for 270000 it's now worth 1.1 or 1.4 million, they don't want to see that wealth decrease. And no government wants to go to an election and say, hey, your property probably shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be worth 10 or 12 times what you paid for it. We're going to add more houses, we're going to add in more subsidies to get more people into the market, and we're going to crack down on the number of investment properties you can own so that we can bring some sort of equilibrium to housing in this nation. And that is part of the problem. And again, we keep having these same arguments and I just implore you, go through the history of this. Go back to, uh, you know, 18, like 20, 32 or 34, when Charles Darwin arrived in Sydney Cove and heard people complaining about the cost of housing and look at every single inquiry we've had since then. And they have all said the same thing, renters' rights, and supply and somehow we don't seem to be able to do it except in the post-war period and the difference there is that both political parties supported it and the only fight that they had was Robert Menzies saying that he would have built more houses than the Labor government did and until we actually have that un that unified position and until we stop looking at people as, as mm. basically passive income we are not going to see this change. And Trina, I want to come to you to, to round out the conversation. Clearly, uh, you've got an enormous job ahead of you. How much of this is going to be about speaking out about the policies and levers that you don't think are working? And how much is it about lobbying governments and oppositions and politicians to come on board with what you think are the answers? I think listening to the comments and getting a good handle on the issue, I think it's important we remember it's not us and them. It's not renters versus landlords. There's room for everyone. There is a supply issue, but also what's a solution to increase affordable rentals? Investment in the right kind of supply, like social and affordable housing. We know that there's a major investment coming to New South Wales from the Commonwealth Government, and I can really see my role alongside strengthening rights to make renting fairer, and making sure that people live in quality accommodation, quality homes, also ensuring that we can bring people together to make that affordable. And one of the key levers there is investment in so social and affordable housing and making sure that we don't fall out and that we work hard together to achieve those outcomes. Katrina well, Jones is the New South Wales Rental Commissioner. Thanks for your company tonight. Thank you.
Well, Qantas gets a new boss tomorrow for the first time in 15 years amid a storm of controversy over the airline's market power. Alan Joyce has brought forward his retirement by two months so the airline can win back lost public confidence. It comes after the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission last week launched legal action against the airline for illegally selling tickets on more than 8,000 flights that it had already decided to cancel. Qantas has also copped public anger and lobbying for the gov uh, for go lobbying rather the government to block its key competitor Qatar Airways from expanding its weekly flight capacity, a move analysts say would have reduced the cost of airfares. And late this afternoon, it's been confirmed that a Senate committee will investigate all government decisions around additional airline services. The Drums' David Taylor has more. Shares in Qantas Airways rose sharply today after the surprise announcement CEO Alan Joyce was retiring earlier than expected. He's been a lightning rod for all the problems of the airline. Uh, I think it was time for Alan to, to move on. Sack Alan Joyce! Sack Alan Joyce! The competition watchdog took Qantas to court last week, alleging it sold online tickets for more than 8,000 flights even after it had cancelled those flights. Mr Toby Joyce, you will have before. opportunity later. When it I'm coincided with Mr Joyce's appearance before a Senate cost of living inquiry last week, where senators grilled him about his salary, the outsourcing of ground handlers, a controversial travel credit scheme and Qantas's efforts to lobby the government to stop Qatar Airways adding more international flights to its schedule, which economists say would have lowered the cost of a ticket for Australian travellers. I thank Alan Joyce for his service, but uh, Australians deserve an aviation sector that is affordable. Alan Joyce has led Qantas through a turbulent 15 years. His tenure began in November 2008 at the onset of the global financial crisis. The next 10 years saw the airline attempt to slash its cost base, leading to mass redundancies and engaging temporary labour hire to cut its wages bill. Qantas is a company that has been using the labour hire loophole in a pretty extraordinary way. Joyce also led Qantas through the pandemic, grounding the airline's entire fleet. Fearing the carrier wouldn't survive, the government gave Qantas nearly $900 million in JobKeeper payments, at the same time as it axed almost a third of its 30,000 strong workforce. Despite its recent bumper profit, that money hasn't been repaid. It's pressure that's been building for 15 years. The Australian people have caught up uh, with the type of Qantas that Alan Joyce was running. In a Qantas media release, Alan Joyce said, quote, there have been many ups and downs and there is clearly much work still to be done, especially to make sure we always deliver for our customers. But I leave knowing that the company is fundamentally strong and has a bright future. Vanessa Hudson, who's worked closely with Alan Joyce for many years running the airline's books, will assume the role of CEO tomorrow. So there's lots of obstacles for her, uh, lots of challenges for her going forward. Qantas chairman Richard Goider says the airline's attitude must and will change, telling the Financial Review... I think it's a time for humility and I think you'll see plenty of that as well. After bouncing at the open of trade, shares in the flying kangaroo closed the day flat. And Naomi, the only consensus today seemed to be uh, around Alan Joyce leaving. Well, I, <laughs> consensus, yes, he's gone, but um, also he's not going to be there to be held to... To, to account for some of the decisions that he's made. You know, off he's gone on his retirement with what is a very large uh, payout, which is just, it just absolutely beggars belief that how a brand that we were so proud of and was one of the te top airlines in the world is now just so, so hated um, and has more complaints to the ACCC than any other uh, brand, in, almost in history. So... I'm just bereft at what has happened to our national carrier. Um, and I'm... Un you know, what we see in terms of, let's say, um, the inc incredible profit is that that has absolutely short-term the airline. 
in terms of these credits? Like, what, why didn't they? Like, I run a voucher business, Red Balloon. It's you know, it's all about giving a voucher. As soon as COVID happened, we made those vouchers valid for five years. Our job is to get people going to do those. Why didn't they do that? Like, why they made it so hard for customers to use those vouchers and to expire them? But the profit is in my opinion, I've seen it. I, I'm the most, you know, the biggest capitalist in the room, I'm pretty sure. But it's, beca <laughs> it's because... He's got a lot of smiles of agreement there, Naomi. <laughs> yeah, I know, but it's because, you know, the cost of airfares have gone up 30% and it's an essential service. Like, you know, being able to get around this country to do business, to see family and friends. Like, we're a big land. It's not easy for us to just jump in a car like other nations. It's an absolute essential service. And the lack of competition um, with both the discount carrier... And, uh, you know, I feel like telling you some stories about like my own personal oh. circumstance. Oh, all right. I cancelled a Jetstar flight um, and I got a voucher and then I went to use it three days later and they said the voucher's invalid. I said, it's three days old. And they said, no, we changed our policy in February oh. last year. And I go... But you've given me a voucher. Well, why have you changed your policy? Well, you spent more money. You upgraded. Right, so you've just taken all... You know, like, how can this be They that they make it so hard for customers? So they changed the policy before you'd actually been given the credit? I got the credit in August. They changed the policy back in February. I reckon the ACCC would be keen to hear about that one as well. Yeah, well, I've just told them. <laughs> I hope they're watching tonight. But, but this is just, you know... but. Everybody's got a story, whether it's the lost luggage that it, it, it and mm. you know, I, I travelled interstate on, on Saturday. Oh no, they just cancelled the flight. Uh, I saw, you know, Deborah Hutton uh, today sitting on her flight going 45 minutes and counting. It's like they don't care about our time. We choose a flight because we need to get somewhere. No, no, we'll just bunch. Bunch all those flights together, cancel them all, we've t got your money, we're not going to give it back, we're not going to give it a credit. If I ran a business like that, I wouldn't have a business and this is the problem that we have. All of this power. And now, look, you know, I've met Alan on many occasions and what he did for the airline in the first two or three years was really terrific. But what has happened to that airline in the last three years, it, 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 it makes me so sad because we were so proud. And I feel for the front of house staff. You know, I mm. travel, travelled last week from um, Broome to Perth uh, to Sydney and those poor staff just cop it. It doesn't matter where it is, but they're being yelled at. And because they're the front line and you've got these fr people trying to get from A to B and who are unbelievably frustrated. So um, you can hear that I'm really disappointed. Yeah, and, and, and that's unacceptable, that, you know, the way that some of those front-of-house people are being treated, because clearly they're not the ones making the decisions. But, Amy, the ones that are are Alan Joyce and his executive team, and in terms of the politics, well, the criticism's really ramped up last week when they appeared before that Senate inquiry. Uh, what happened? <laughs> Well, I mean, like, it, it is almost as if capitalism has failed us. And if you put profits above all else, well, you don't actually help the people that you're meant to be serving. Um, I think that, that feels the, loaded. <laughs> I think that the Senate in, uh, in inquiry appearance that Alan Joyce made last week, which was part of a cost of living inquiry, really kind of gave the push along to the news that we saw today. And that is because Alan Joyce didn't actually have any answers. He had to be basically compelled to attend to this inquiry mm. in in the first place. He had to be summoned to turn up. I don't think he'd fronted a Senate inquiry before that either. And then when he got there, he basically was just like, oh, well, you know, times are tough and maybe we've made some missteps, but, you know, that's the way business goes. And I think that was just the cherry on a very, 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 very angry cake. And that's what has led to what we've seen today. But it has also raised a lot of questions about uh, how close our politicians have got to Alan Joyce and to Qantas as an organisation organization and that maybe that that power really does need to be scrutinized not just over the Qatar sit decision but just over how much flexibility Qantas has had in the market because of its buddy buddy relationships with politicians of all stripes. Mm. Um, it, Richie and it felt like at that uh, Senate inquiry the politicians of all stripes were just lining up to to rip Qantas in, in on so many different fronts. It was also there that we discovered around th the flight credits that 
Qantas has $370 million uh, worth of flight credits. Jetstar has $100 million, which didn't include overseas customers. What did you make of that? Because that made many Australians just go, what? You're, hold, you're just holding on to these. Oh, look, it, it blows your mind sort of how bad things have gotten at Qantas. You know, like Dan, you know, Qantas have screwed up a whole bunch of departure times recently, but the early departure of Alan Joyce, I think, is not one of them. A lot of people are looking forward to seeing the back of Alan Joyce, really because you've taken a fantastic brand, national flag carrier, one, you know, even back to when uh, Dustin Hoffman in Rain Man was talking about how good Qantas was on safety. And you've just driven that brand straight into the ground. And it seems like every month we're finding more and more what's happened when you pop open the hood here. And these travel credits are just another example of that. And it's almost like you have a company that's offering purely for profit, but is then still trying to cash in on that public brand, that national significance, the public benefit that it is supposed to be delivering. So it's first in line to get you know, COVID payments, but at the same time is very happy to just provide a whole variety of cancellations or these dud travel credits. Mm. Well, on those travel credits, Rachel, the, there was an arbitrary date of December 31 set, and if, it didn't, if you didn't use them by then, they were going to be lost. The furor last week meant that they backflipped. Why did it take that long? Well, I mean, I mean, when you, when things kind of compound, I think there's a, you know there's the travel credits, there's the constant price gouging, there's the cancelled flights, um, but most important for me, I've I've got to say is not is not the travel credits, it's the abhorrent treatment of workers at Qantas. Mm -hmm. Over many, many years, including grounding the national carrier, um, in, including calling what the Transport Workers Union um, called was um, the biggest set of illegal sackings in Australian history. You know, all of it's catching up, right? All of it's catching up, and rightly so. But to what end? So he's gone two months early with, you know, falling on a very, very cashed up sword. Um, is there any guarantee that Qantas is going to do anything about any of this? No. All we've heard is, a, you know, a marginally early departure, still with a payout of something between 12 and 24 million. So it really doesn't sound like, you know, much of a sacrifice at all. Mm. I'm glad you mentioned the people. I was going to ask you about yeah. that, that uh, in a moment. But Amy, in amongst all of this, the ACCC launched legal action against Qantas alleging false, misleading or deceptive conduct by advertising and selling tickets for more than 8,000 flights that had been cancelled. Now, those tickets, we understand, were sold on average a fortnight after being cancelled and in some cases up to 47 days later. The competition watchdog saying Qantas should pay a fine of around $250 million dollars if they lose. Where does this all play into this couple of weeks for Qantas? Well, it was just another another knock in the credibility of Qantas. Where Qantas was saying that, you know, they were doing everything they could in the market. And then we learned that there's these allegations, very strong allegations from the ACCC who don't go to court unless they're pretty sure of their case, that they were cancelling flights but continuing to sell them. And as Naomi was saying, that has massive impacts on people's time in terms of their business and seeing their family. But it also has impacts on the workers. There is so much that has been rotting in Qantas for so long and it hasn't just been the last three years it's probably been the last decade or more when we've seen how they've treated pilots how they've treated maintenance workers how they've treated their hospitality staff how they've treated their frontline staff and we've seen all of that go forward and forward and forward I mean it, there's a, a joke within the industry if some, a company decides to enact the Joyce rule or do you know business the Joyce way when they start going to labor hire and selling off parts of their business in order order to be able to contract cheaper workers. All of it has chipped away at the credibility of Qantas. And it is, again, something that really needs to be looked at. Because, yes, there are questions about competition and what a role the government and Qantas's relationship played in limiting competition in Australia. But there's also questions over how regulations have been allowed to be stomped on, how loopholes have been allowed to be exploited, and what needs to happen to ensure that we start to rebuild this airline, not just Qantas, but the industry as a whole. And that perfectly leads me, Naomi, to the responsibility of the board because, of course, on the one hand, they've got a responsibility to do what's in the interest of the company and in the interest of shareholders, but then on the other hand, there's also people. And reputation is a huge part of this, which is what some of the big investors in the last week have said, 
you guys need to sort your stuff out. How much of this lands at the feet of the board? So the board and all directors of any enterprise have the responsibility of looking after not just the value as at of the asset, but the long-term viability for all stakeholders. So that's not just um, shareholders, but it's all stakeholders. Um, and I guess one of the things that I'm just not clear on is, is when you um, incentivise somebody to a certain set of activities, then that's what they're going to do. So it looks looks on paper, and I can only see what's in the public domain, as if this airline has been short-termed. And what we mean by that is they've maximised profit as much as they possibly can. They have um, made sure that those aircraft are old and they haven't purchased a new aircraft in a very long time. They've outsourced, they've cut off, and they've, they've, they've absolutely sh what we call short-termed, and let alone the reputational uh, uh, event. You know, do you see a Quadrasat now and you just go, lie, lie, pants on fire? Like, that's, that's an awfully cynical thing to say. So I guess it's how is the remuneration set for all of the executives, and ultimately that is the responsibility of the remuneration committee, which would be advising the um, the board, and it would all it also raises, I think, a question about the strategy that the board sets and is responsible for overseeing. Uh, Richie, the Qantas chair, Richard Goida, uh, has said this afternoon that he's not going to be resigning as well, but also promised a more quote humble Qantas. What does that mean? And is he talking about wholesale culture change? Look, um, anybody who's dealt with Qantas will understand how difficult that... Years and years ago, I was very grateful to win a supply agreement to Qantas and the, 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 what was required just was unre unrealistic. And so how they treat their supply community as well, and I just know that firsthand, and I've probably told tales out of school, but there is no sense of humility or no sense of understanding. It's literally, if you're a supplier, we're going to get as much as we possibly can from you, never mind if it puts you out of business. So it's across the board, this, you know, we're Qantas, we have a monopoly, we can do what we like. And um, I'll tell you what, if Virgin lists again, shortly I'll be buying shares because I think a lot of Australians just are looking for the alternate and it's really up to our government to look at aviation policy mm. and see how we can get more airlines into this country. Yeah, which I think Amy was touching on at the start. Uh, Richie, that, that comment from Richard Goida about being humble, what did you make of that? Uh, it, it sounds good, but really at this stage you need action. And so the question is that humility also lead to actually the board looking inwards and wondering whether it's done the right job. And this is not just one man and one vision and a number of poor choices, uh, this is systemic, or it certainly looks so from the outside. Mm -hmm. And so really, I think humility here would also see the board really question whether they've done the right thing and whether they need to step aside, and also whether the management at Qantas, I mean, you're replacing Joyce with one of his deputies, is that really the right move at this time, or should we be looking at for wholesale change? Mm. A board as well as one man was called upon to make a company profitable and look what they did. Let's not forget that we actually all used to own Qantas and mm. it was sold off and privatised by Paul Keating back in the day. And here we are. What a surprise. Yeah. It's almost as if it's Scooby-Doo when you pull off Alan Joyce's fat mask <laughs> and the board is sitting behind it. <laughs> We'll have to come back to that one. Finally tonight, the Spanish men's team has dealt the country's embattled football boss a huge blow, denouncing his recent behaviour at the World Cup as unacceptable. Mr Rubiales was, has defied expectations and refused to resign as president of the Spanish Football Federation after forcibly kissing Jenny Hermoso on the lips following Spain's victory in the Women's World Cup. Queremos rechazar... We want to reject what we consider to be unacceptable behaviour from Mr Rubiales who has not been up to the standard of the institution he represents. We stand clearly with the values of the sport. 
Luis Rubiales has since been suspended over his infamous World Cup kiss, which was painted as football's Me Too moment. Now, we are almost out of time, but I want to get around everyone. Rachel, how did you respond to this from the men's team? This is really important. The modelling of men in this sphere, not to say, oh, um, he said, she said, you know, what, what excuse can we wait to say this is unacceptable? For every woman who's ever been treated like this in the workplace, this is a model of how men should be by upstanders as well as bystanders. Mm, it draws a line in the sand. Amy, I've got to admit, I was surprised that, uh, that Rubiales hasn't taken responsibility for his behaviour. I found it that quite startling. Well, I didn't, be, and probably because, like, I've dealt with a lot of powerful men for a very long time, and mm. that tends to be the norm. And that is the problem, is that it was done on the world stage, it was done openly, and instead of the immediate condemnation and the stepping down and the taking accountability, there were cries of cancel culture and digging in and mothers going on hunger strikes. And that is the absolute issue with all of this, is that we don't believe women, we don't believe what we see, and we often just come up with these excuses, which is why what the men's team has done is so important and there needs to be more of it. Mm. Naomi, uh, have the authorities responded forcefully enough? No, I don't think so. And I, I, even to the point, I think the men's team could have come out a little bit earlier. If we just put this in the context, if he had have in that moment said, oh my goodness, I cannot believe I did this. I am so sorry and I'm so sorry for everybody concerned. This, this will never happen again. Like just own it, like straight away, because mistakes do happen. But if, if, if I put this in the... This is their, those people's workplace. Mm. Remember, they are paid to play sport and that is their workplace. And if, if I was winning an award because of a great sales achievement and my boss kissed me on the lips in front of the whole company, I would be humiliated. Like, just put it into the absolute layman's vernacular of what could happen in their own workplaces. An immediate apology. Mm. Richie, how important is it for men, such as the team, to stand up and, and speak out? Uh, and, and what do you think about Naomi you know, saying it should have happened earlier? It's critical for men to stand uh, for you know, the decency and, and the standard you walk past is the standard you set. So it's important for men to come out and to condemn this behaviour. You know, my five-year-old daughter watched the Women's World Cup now wants to play soccer. We all watched that final, and what a what a horrible way to end it all. And so mm. it, this is about time that this is corrected. It could have happened sooner. It should have happened sooner, and I'm glad that it's finally happening. Mm. I, I reckon you're right that there's going to be lots of uh, little girls that were watching and they're going to be playing and making a big difference in the future. We've got about a minute left, Rachel. Uh, how do you keep this momentum going? And and do you think that change is possible? in this area without men speaking out? Um, I am of the belief that it requires every single person. It mm. requires every single uh, person to be both an ally um, as well as somebody who is a perpetuator of exemplar behaviour. But particularly when you're in the public spotlight such as that, particularly in a tournament that was so groundbreaking for women's sport here and overseas, particularly for somewhere where there are so many, many role models on show, what, um, you know, an absolute abhorrence um, to see that on display. Yeah. Well, that is all we have time for tonight. Thank you so much to the panel, Rachel Jacobs, Richie Mersey and Amy Ramikas and Naomi Simpson. Do have an excellent evening. Julia Baird will be with you tomorrow. For now, though, good night.